Hello. Welcome to the next of our podcast series on IFRS9's new impairment requirements. I'm Sandra Thompson. I lead our global accounting technical function for financial instruments. And hi, I'm Mark Randall. I work on our UK accounting technical function where I look after the UK banking practice. In this podcast, we're going to revisit the subject of what's a significant increase in credit risk. So just to recap on the requirements of IFRS 9, when a bank first originates a loan, it will be in what's called stage one, and a bank will book a 12-month expected credit loss. The bank then monitors the loan, and if there is a significant increase in credit risk, the loan moves to stage two or three, and the bank will increase the amount of the loss provision up to a lifetime expected credit loss. So what is a significant increase in credit risk? It's going to be a key aspect of implementing the standard. The term is not actually defined in IFRS 9, so it will need to be a judgment that banks will need to make in practice. And where they make that judgment could significantly impact the amount of impairment losses they book. I'm going to start off by telling you a few things that a significant increase in credit risk is not, and then Mark's going to talk a bit more about how banks might actually measure significant increase in practice. So let's start with what a significant increase in credit risk is not. It's not an absolute test, it's a relative test. What I mean by that is it's not the case that all loans below a certain credit grade will be in stage two. Rather, banks will need to monitor the credit risk of a loan and see if it has significantly increased since when the loan was first recognised. And this can have some strange effects. For example, a bank may have two loans to the same counterparty originated at different times and when the borrower had a different credit risk. One of those loans could be in stage one and one of those loans could be in stage two. And of course that doesn't match with how banks commonly model credit risk for credit risk management purposes. Having said that, we are aware that some banks are looking to demonstrate they can use an absolute threshold because it's a suitable proxy for the relative increase in credit risk. Now obviously if a bank wants to do that, they need to demonstrate it is a reasonable proxy and they'll need to keep that under review. The second point is a significant increase in credit risk depends on the risk of default, not the risk of loss. What I mean by that, if you have a loan that's fully collateralised, it can still move from stage one to stage two if the borrower becomes significantly less likely to repay. Even though if the borrower defaults, the bank may expect no loss because the loan is fully collateralised. I'm now going to hand over to Mark, who's going to talk a bit more about how banks actually plan to do this in practice. Thanks, Sandra. So, yeah, looking at how banks do this in practice, it's important to note that the standard doesn't require that you use a probability of default to assess that uh, increase in credit risk. However, in practice, many banks are using PD, so that's what I'll refer to. And as Sandra explained, the base requirement of the standard is that the significant increase in credit risk is judged by reference to the lifetime risk of default or the lifetime PD. However, the standard does allow you to use a 12-month PD if that's a suitable proxy for changes in the lifetime PD. But the important things to note is, first of all, analysis needs to be done up front to demonstrate that that really is the case. And then secondly, even if that holds a transition, banks need to monitor that on an ongoing basis. And if it's no longer true that the 12-month PD is a good proxy for changes in the lifetime PD, a bank would need to move back to using the full lifetime PD for assessing whether or not there's been a significant increase. And that might be a real logistical challenge. So something needs to be considered up front when judging whether or not to make use of that allowance in the standard. Many banks are looking to use data they have from their regulatory capital calculations as that is often based on 12-month periods. But a word of warning, whilst they may well have a 12-month PD, there can be a number of differences between the definitions that are appropriate for IFRS 9 purposes versus what is used for regulatory purposes. So one classic example is that regulatory PDs are often a through the cycle measure that's an average of the probability of default over an entirety of a credit cycle. That contrasts with the requirement of IFRS 9, which is that the probability of default is what the PD is at the reporting date, a so-called point in time uh, PD. That's just one of a number of potential differences there may be. So it's really important that banks assess the impact of those differences and make adjustments where necessary. And the devil really can be in the detail. Thank you, Mark. 
So just to recap, what's a significant increase in credit risk will be a key judgment in implementing IFRS 9. It is a relative test, not an absolute test, and it is based on the risk of default, not the risk of loss. In practice, banks can use 12-month PDs if they can show that's a suitable proxy for a lifetime PD. However, if they want to use regulatory capital data, then they're almost certainly going to have to adjust that data. Thanks very much for listening. Hope you'll join us next time when we're exploring a bit more detail what banks are actually going to do and the kind of data they're going to look at. Bye-bye. Thank you.